and we have an invited guest. His name is Dr. Michelle Gatney. I'm sure if you follow my channel, you will have known him uh, from his other interviews and you're going to learn great things from his presentation. Today, we're going to talk about his project. So let's subscribe to my channel and if you have any questions, comment down below. Now, Dr. Gatney, will come here and us with your new project. Okay, greeting uh, to everyone. Uh, nice to talk to you again, Sarah. Of course, today is a very nice day of February. It's very cold outside, but it's very beautiful sunny day where I am in Mirabel. So, of course, where I am right now, you know, it's been more than 50 years. I work with champions and I will share a little bit where it brought me in these 50 years. It's mostly to share how people can reclaim their birthright. All human beings have the power to be champion, to be high achiever, to be successful. Of course, many people think, you know, you have to be born from a rich family or you need to have special body capacity and everything. But in reality, it's very different. Uh, for myself, well, I was born to be a dairy cow farmer. Of course, I come from a family of dairy cow farming. And until the age of 10 years old, I was living in a village of 360 people in the middle of nowhere in Quebec. But lucky to me, my parents moved to the city of Montreal when I was nine years old. And by the age of 10, I participated in a thing that I discovered after was my first competition, my first race. So I was in a recreational program for kids. And then they asked all the children 10 years old, come here and we go there. And there was a lineup of kids. And then suddenly somebody used a gun and punk and I saw all the kids running. I started running. And at the end, there were people waiting, and then I was trying. I thought it was, you know, you have to escape the people, and then they catch me. So I thought I was dead, but in fact, I won a race. It was my first. And this was my introduction to what sport was all about. Because in the dairy cow, the only thing we were running after were the cow, the chicken, and that's it. So competition didn't exist in my village. The only thing that existed was everybody was children, the farmer, and that's it. So... Living with nature was, was my life until I moved to the city of Montreal. Of course, with the years, it had brought me to quite an adventure. So, But for me, really, everything started in 1967. And that's when I learned one thing. To be the best, you have to learn from the best. Of course, what does that mean? Well, by 1967, I started meeting people that became my, my mentor, if I can say, it started very interestingly by meeting a Tibetan monk who was in Montreal for the 1967 World Expo. And his name was Robson Lampa. And from him, I've learned one thing, the first exercise in the visualization and imagery and meditation. So by the age of 17, I was entering university. And through that monk, I've learned some basic training, breathing technique, and mostly imagery training technique which led me quite a lot after that. And of course, in 1967, I was also lucky that at university, I had the privilege to have as a lecturer, uh, Dr. And since then, I've learned how we can master stress and how without stress, there is no performance. So I've learned that stress is the spice of life. And this is what I teach with people initially started with young kids, then uh, young adults, then uh, people in management, and this brought me up. So long story short, and of course, I had the privilege in my life to, to learn one thing, the most important. If you want to learn something, go to the originator of the idea of the concept. So I, I traveled the world. I went to Sweden. I went to Switzerland. I went to Spain. I went to France. I went to England. And of course, I traveled the world quite a lot, more than 40 times I traveled the world in the last... 50 years. So I've worked in more than 40 countries, thousands and thousands of people in management and athlete. And for me, it really started in 1967. And two years ago, we did a, a reunion of the people I was working with. So I was 17 years old when I started, and these people were 12 and 14 years old. And very interesting today, I'm still in contact with nearly 50 of them. And interestingly, this year is the Olympic game in China. And two of athletes that I had that I work with, one is Marie-Josée Turcotte, who is the anchor women for the 
French Channel of the Olympic Games, and she was one of my high jumper, and now she is top anchor lady at Radio Canada. Another one is uh, Gaetan Boucher, who was in 1980 the first Olympic gold medalist from my club in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And now he is, uh, in the, he is the analyst of the speed skating event. He was himself the first winner in Sarajevo Olympic game of the gold medal in speed skating. And in a way, he became the role model for a generation of young people. And of course, this has opened the concept. What the heck is it to be a champion? Because me, I've learned one thing. I was lucky enough in 1972, I went to Munich Olympic game. And I was part of a delegation, and I had the chance to go around as a VIP to see all the best Olympic athletes. You know, I was in swimming pool, seeing Mark Spitz winning eight gold medal, Olga Corbett renovate, uh, you know, innovating the concept of gymnastic. And, and I, I saw her, and I had the privilege with Olga Corbett that I saw her performing in 1972 in Munich as the top gymnast. And I had the privilege in Malaysia years after to work with her coach who was the Malaysian coach for the Commonwealth Games 1998. So long story, very interesting. And I've learned, you know, at the time I was young, there was one athlete very famous in the world, and his name was Cassius Klee, Mohammed Ali. And he had the concept, champions are not made in gym, champions are made with something they have deep inside them, a desire, a dream, a vision. So since then, I work with, I always say, if you have children who dream, send them to me. I want to work with them. And of course, I discovered that champions come in all kinds of shape, from all kinds of social status. Rich or poor can be champion. Champion is a mindset, and it's a mindset that develops very young. So you must desire, you must dream, you must vision. And of course, successful people know what they want. Unsuccessful people know what they don't want. And that's the big difference between the two. And that's why when I develop people, the first thing I always ask them, exactly what do you want? Why are you doing what you're doing? And many people actually watch the Olympic. You think athletes go to the Olympic because they want a gold medal? Very few athletes who go to the Olympic want a medal. Many of them, what they want is to be an athlete at the Olympic. They want to go to the Olympic. Me, I wanted yeah. to, be, to, to discover the Olympics since the age of 10 years old. I went to the Olympic in 1972 in Munich. But I went there never as an athlete. I was a member of a Canadian delegation before, because Montreal was hosting the 1976 Olympic game. So what I wanted was to go to the Olympic. And I went. I knew athletes who have trained all their years for the, going to the Olympic. They never went because they wanted to win a medal. You don't want a medal. A medal happened as a consequence of doing a performance. You don't want a medal. You get it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's connected with performance. A performance is the name of the game. You must want a performance. And that performance might give you the goal, might give you success. High performance pe people are very clear in what they want exactly. And many athletes, I discover it, you know, working with so many athletes for so many years. At the Olympic, they want a picture of themselves in the, in the game village. They want a picture of themselves with the champion. They want souvenir, like right now in Beijing. All the athletes are looking for this panda. Only those who win medal receive the panda from the Olympic Committee. So many athletes are going all around Beijing right now to try to find panda, and all their family back home want a panda. So right now, even the Chinese factory who make this panda are now having to increase supply because there is a huge demand worldwide now for this panda as a souvenir from the Beijing Olympic Games. So, of course, I developed since then the concept of the me I see in my mind is the me I will be. So everything starts with a vision of yourself. You have to, eat, to see yourself accomplishing your target, your dream. And of course, if you accomplish your dream, you might get a medal, you might be famous, you might be successful, and in my case, you might become rich. But they don't go there to be rich. They don't go there for They go there because they see themselves there. You have to see themselves. It's a deep introspection. And of course, for me, I was lucky, you know, 1972, when I came back from Munich, I created the Montreal International Multisports Club. Of course, at that time, I was 22 years old. In Quebec, even, even when I applied for my club registration, I was rejected initially. They say, who are you to pretend to create Montreal International? I say, well, I went to Munich. I saw what champions were. Before 1972, 
I saw them on a TV screen. TV screen is very small. That's an Olympic champion. But in Munich, I was walking with them. And I say, wow, if this is Olympic champion, my God, I got plenty in Montreal. And of course, they were very young at that time. So from my club, uh, at the time, we created a multi-sport club. And one of the events was track and field. I was a track and, a track and, track and field coach. I was a high jump coach. And of course, my athlete became successful after Munich very quick. Because I was able to make them dreaming, dreaming of what? What? Becoming champion, becoming record holder. When you do what you do, do it better. And that's it. And can you see yourself doing what you do better than what you used to do? So you have to look what you are right now and dream what you want to be. And the rest in between is just everything you do day by day. Many people say you need to have very big goal. Yes, but you need daily goal. You know, to become a champion is to do ordinary thing extremely well day by day. But most people don't practice every day. So I achiever champion have habits. I achiever habit. So I have a special program where I help people to reflect on the habits that they have developed in their life. And of course, from my Montreal International Club, you know, this athlete, Gaetan Boucher, and I think I can show you. I hope oh, yeah. Cool. So Gaetan Boucher, the first athlete winning in the 19, you know, at the Sarajevo mm -hmm. Olympic Games, 1980, took eight years from 1972 to 1980 to be the first Olympic gold medalist at the Sarajevo Olympic Games. And with him, eight athletes from the same club won from the 1980 Olympic Games until 1994 Olympic Games from the same club in Montreal, they were, you know, three girls, five boys, won 25 Olympic medal in speed skating, all members of the Montreal International Club. More medal than Malaysia as a country has won ever Olympic medal since the beginning of the history of the Olympic. How come in one club, eight athletes win 25 Olympic medal? And if you watch Beijing right now, you notice that there's a lot of French Canadian athletes winning medals in speed skating. One of the best is Kim Boutin from Sherbrooke. So from these Montreal international athletes, it has created an awareness and opening that French Canadian were among the best skater in the world in the short track. And of course, now we see Canadian doing very well in the long track and short track in speed skating. And of course, now it has opened to many others. <clears throat> so my job is just Help ordinary people to realize you can be whatever you want. How you do this? Every day do something better than yesterday. Every day. Every day. It's a day-by-day day thing. But many people need think, you know, you have to be born in a certain way. Uh, when, when I was young, people were thinking in Quebec that only the English were good. We were French Canadians. So when I was competing in track and field, our only objective was to beat the English was never to be the best we can be because the mentality of the French Canadian at the time was, oh, we are conquered with a colony from the British. So we had to be the British. But you don't become a, Bri a British by, by becoming a champion by people. You become a champion by becoming a better version of yourself. So my program, what I do in the last 50 years, I help people to develop a better version of themselves, how to get better by yourself. And of course, in, in all the athletes I even work, I had one girl that I met, you know, and she eventually became Governor General of Canada. She became the first lady astronaut for Canada in space. And mm -hmm. I was a synchronized swimming girl who, 1984, preparing for the Olympic game in Los Angeles, took eight years to achieve their gold medal and silver medal in Barcelona, the game that you participated, Sarah. So Sylvie Fréchette and the Villagos sister were finally eight years after the winning medal at the Olympic. Many people want to result fast. If we notice, if you observe these Winter Olympic right now, we notice many athletes in many sports are at their third, fourth, or fifth Olympic Games. So meaning to get medal doesn't happen necessarily at the first appearance, but it can, because we see at these Olympic Games again without pressure, like we saw it in Japan uh, during last summer. Olympic game without spectator. We saw 13, 14 years old becoming Olympic champion. 
here in the Beijing, we see athletes 15 years old, 16 years old, becoming Olympic champion at their first appearance. But usually it takes experience. But the last two Olympics, thanks to the pandemic, have removed the presence of public attendance. So the stadium are empty. And in China, you were there in 1990 at the Asian Games, the stadium, you see uh, spectators, oh, yeah. spectator. all of them are military personnel dressed as civilian to show that there are people in the stadium. But in fact, there is no ticket that have been sold in China. Only people have been given access to the site to show on TV that there are people watching the game. But this is military personnel from the public republic of China. So games are not the same anymore. And of course, what's the big difference with summer? I was lucky enough until 1976. So until 76, uh, I worked mostly with summer sport, track and field. But in, after the Montreal Olympic game, I lost my motivation. You know, I was a chief judge appointed for the Olympic events in the Olympic Stadium. I was manager of the training venue, and I was one of my athletes competing in the high jump competition. So the dream of everyone is to go to the Olympic. So as an official, track and field official, I wanted to be chief judge at the Olympic, and I was appointed. Then I was a coach of one athlete at the Olympic, and I wanted more. I was manager of the training venue for all the athletic events. So all the country coming to Montreal have to come through me for services for training in preparation for the competition. But after that, I wanted to show, if I've done this in track and field, can I do it somewhere else? And I started in 1977 working with the Quebec Figure Skating Association. Because at the time, you notice, if you watch a little bit figure skating, now with these young Russians, they're doing four spin. They call it quadruple. Before it was triple. But in the 70s, it was double. So me, I realized one thing. I'm a high jump coach. And the only thing that was missing to the figure skater to do triple was they were just jumping too, too low. So I brought them high jump technique that is now used. If you look at the figure skating, you will notice that when they jump, before doing the spin, the triple or quadruple, they, had, they are using their arm and their free leg. So this is high jump technique that I brought to the concept of figure skating. And for years, until 1988, I worked with Canadian figure skater. So I became a consultant with the Canadian Figure Skating Association, working with all the French-Canadian speaking athletes on the Canadian team, because at the time, many of the young French Canadian were not speaking English. Now it's totally different. Now the young generation now is most of them fully bilingual because Canada is a bilingual country. So if your coach speak English and you speak only French, you have a communication problem. And I was the one bridging the gap with the athletes in that case. So for years, I worked with figure skating. And from figure skating, of course, I was still continuing doing my track and field. And I was still involved, you know, in synchronized swimming. And when I went to Malaysia in 1989, of course, I moved to a country that had no success in anything. They were good. And, but because I had the mentality of what I did in Quebec, champion, ordinary people. And at that time, your minister of youth and sport, uh, Datu Najib Tun Razak, who, who is actually uh, very famous for other reasons, sent me all over Malaysia to assess our Malaysian material for world-class performance. And I had the privilege in 1988-89 to travel all the states of Malaysia, including the jungle of Borneo, including your hometown, Kinokota, Kinabalu, and mostly going to school and sports club and assess, have you seen any champion? I say, well, I've seen in Malaysia as many champions in potential that I've seen in Canada. The only thing Malaysian people think, oh, we are small people, we are poor people, we cannot make it. And of course, today, we even have Malaysian competing at the Beijing Olympic, Winter Olympic. Malaysia don't even have snow. How come Malaysia, a summer country, eternal summer, can have now at least doing alpine ski, doing figure skating? Well, Ordinary people can achieve anything they want. It's just a matter of being committed, having dreams, and making it happen. So all this has evolved. And, of course, if we compare summer and uh, winter sport, most countries in the world don't have winter all year long. But many countries in the world have summer all year long. 
Canada, actually, I've been in a winter country. We have for four, five months a year, winter. So winter sports are very popular, mostly the ice hockey. And actually, you will notice why right now the best ice hockey team for female in the world is the Canadian ice hockey team. And very funny, one of my athletes in track and field who have never been good enough to be a national champion, well, became top ice hockey player. She she played in five World Cup and she won Olympic gold for, for Canada, top scorer. Her name is from St. Louis. Was a top, you know, ice hockey player coming from track and field. But she had a passion. She loved ice hockey. And she eventually created a high hockey program in the CEGEP in Quebec a sport program for young girls who want to become ice hockey player. And now we see a lot of young French Canadian hockey player being on the national Olympic team in, uh, in Beijing. And we say a lot of it, thanks to France Saint Louis, who became one of the first CZ education teacher to decide to promote ice hockey for girls. And of course, ice hockey for girls is growing in number in, in Canada. But we notice one thing with, because of winter situation, uh, even Jamaica, now they have a, 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 a alpine skier at 37 years old. Of course, finished last in the competition. So what? Uh, he's an ordinary guy, but how to do, you know, alpine ski in Jamaica? There is no snow no either, but he migrated to Europe and he trained and he qualified for Jamaica competing in <coughs> alpine ski, which, you know, the, the beauty of Europe, <coughs> they have the alpine, you know, the Alps mountain. So they have places where they can ski all year long. And this is one of the problems in Canada. When summer comes, where do you do your winter sport? Most of our Canadian athletes have to migrate. They, mm -hmm. they either go to New Zealand because when it's summer in Canada, it's winter in New Zealand. And in New Zealand, they have fantastic slope for alpine ski. Or they go to Europe. And it's the same thing for many countries. Many athletes have to develop. Even right now, the men hockey team from China are mostly made of Chinese Canadians because hockey didn't exist in China. Now, after this Beijing Olympic, you can count on one thing. You're going to see a lot of ice hockey club emerging in China and the Chinese government will be committed. Chinese can be good ice hockey player, but until this Beijing Olympic game, they've never been exposed because China is a cold country in the winter, but no snow. And the Beijing Olympic Games show us one thing. If you put the money where it is, you can have among the most beautiful winter Olympic facility. Of course, at what cost? Well, China put the dollar bill to make it happen. Their facility are unbelievable. They're above anything that anybody have done in the world. And of course, many people are saying, but their snow is not even natural. Of course, it's use of water. They use the snow cannon. But many of the skiers now are saying the beauty of artificial snow, it's more consistent than natural snow. And here exactly, in Canada, yeah. we do, sometimes it's, uh, the snow is compact, sometimes it's very fluffy. So natural snow is very variable where artificial <laughs> snow is consistent. But of course, it demands one thing. Winter competition athletes have to go overseas because of seasonal adaptation. And we see even Canada training, you know, athletes in figure skating that come from other countries. Malaysia had their first figure skater at the last Olympic game. And he was trained in Toronto, thank to you, Sarah, at the Mariposa School of, uh, of figure skating with Doug Lee as master instructor. And actually, I worked with Doug in the 70s before moving to Malaysia. So, and it's a story all over the world. And now many people don't realize to be a champion, it doesn't always happen in your backyard. You have to be ready to pack your luggage and to go where the expertise is for you to become a champion. You have to go where the best of the best are. Because to be the best, you have to learn from the best. And that's why it is very important for athletes to move, to go around. The only thing is many officials want to keep them so that they get the pride of the success of others. And you notice at the Beijing Olympic, we see athletes championing, winning medal. Where are the coaches? They, we barely mention their name. Coach are the big shadow in the success of others. And that's the beauty of the, of the Olympic winter or summer. The story of coaching is the same. Without a coach, no athlete make it happen. But athletes come from all shape of life, all social status. 
and all culture can succeed. So summer country can succeed in winter sport. Winter sport, winter country can succeed in summer sport. We have to allow people to achieve their dreams, their vision, and to claim their birthright to be what they are born to be. And who know what you are born to be? Yourself. You have to discover within yourself what are your dream, your vision, your desire to succeed. And basically, this is what it's all about. First, you have to realize that you cannot borrow body of others, but you can borrow their habits. So it's to learn 21 basic habits of the champion and the high achiever. And habits is something that we learn from our family first, our culture, our education, our religion, our language, our country. And sometimes we say they become trapped into us until we die. You know, it's it's forever. And this is where things come from. But it's basically a young age that we build up. How do we build up this? Well, first, from everything we hear as a, as a new baby, we learn from our environment. We learn to adjust to our environment. So if our environment is made of loser, we become a loser. If your environment is made of rich people, you have a high chance to be rich. So we, we, we adapt to the environment we are born. So if you take a newborn baby and you bring him to any country in the world, he will become part of that culture, part of that country. He will be educated there, will become there. And if you now, you, you are in Quebec and in Canada, and Sarah, you're a good example. Your sons were born in Canada. Are they Malaysian or are they Canadians? Of course, if I look outside, of course, they are Chinese. Mommy is a Chinese. Daddy is a Chinese. But your son, what are they? It's to them to decide who they are. And the beauty, you give them access to an open world. You are Chinese by genes. But you are Canadian by birth, by education, by culture. But you are also a Malaysian because my mom is a Malaysian. So what I be me, I have a son that by the same age as one of your sons. He's going to be 15 soon. And my son's mother is a Filipino. What is he, a Filipino? He's been born in Malaysia. He lived 13 years of his life in Malaysia. He is more Malaysian than he's Canadian. And yeah, I'm not really Chinese. French. Yeah, I'm not really 100% Chinese. I'm Sino yeah. Gadazan, yeah. which means that my parents and both of my parents have a mix of the native, like the First Nation of Sabah, you know, the native yeah. of uh, Sabah. You know, Sabah, the North Borneo Island, they have their own uh, Aboriginal group, the ethnic group. But this is uh, the first, <clears throat> it's like the ethnic group that is like the, uh, it's like a First Nation. It's yeah. the, uh, we call it Dusun and Karazan. My my mother's side is from Karazan. My mom's my father's side is from Dusun. So I am Sino Karazan. Um, yeah, but you know many Sino Karazan they they look um, Oriental. Uh, they they look Chinese or sometimes they look Filipino. Sometimes they look like uh, Korean. And for me, many people thought that I'm Korean. Especially my name last name is Chong C H U N G. And many thought that I'm a Korean. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's a bit of my background. Yeah, but that's good. At least, but now with the idea is we give our children an open world, not a closed world. So they have access and they have access to discover. There is no limit. Only themselves can limit themselves. And basically, this is what it's all about, is to learn these things that all of us have the potential to be whatever we want to be. But of course, we have to unlearn what we've learned sometime, which are the limitation of our family, religion, culture, education. So we have to unlearn to learn new things. And to learn things is you can dream and be whatever you want to be. So of course, the problem is everything that we have that we call the subconscious mind today has been developed when we were below seven years old. So, of course, when we are young, we are just like a sponge. We absorb everything around us. So that's why many children in the world speak only one language, the language of their parent or the language of our education. Uh, thanks to me, when I went to Malaysia, I was uh, so surprised to see so many Malaysians speaking three, four, five languages. 
Yeah. Even if <laughs> there's only one official language in the country, how come children learn so many? Because it's a multiracial country. So people are surrounded by friends from other culture who speak different languages. And of course, below the age of seven years old, there is one brain frequency near the brain mature from baby to adults. It takes 39 years for the brain to nearly reach full maturity. And each year we mature, each seven year we mature a different brain frequency. So when we are below the age of seven, we mostly operate in theta brain frequency that become the subconscious mind of adult. Adult experience theta brain frequency only when they are in deep sleep, in deep dream. And most people don't remember what they dream about. But that's, that's the same thing. Everything we learn as a child below the age of seven, most adults don't even remember. But it's all inside us. And this is what we call the subconscious mind. That's why many people say that people are limited by their subconscious mind. And they say you have to reprogram. The brain is not a computer. A computer has been developed by understanding the brain. The brain is conditioned. We adapt to the environment by conditioning ourselves to the, the environment. Well, you've learned in Canada, outside it's cold, but you learn one thing, without proper clothing, you can have frostbite at minus 30 in 10 minutes. But in Malaysia, how do you survive at 28 degree temperature all year long? As a foreigner, I was always surprised. How come Malaysians don't sweat? But foreigner, we walk 10 minutes outside, we're, we, we're wet everywhere. Because our sweat gland have not learned to sweat. In Malaysia, when you're born, temperature is 28 or 30. So your sweat glands start to, to learn to sweat at birth. Me, I've been born at minus 20. When do you think my sweat gland learn to, to sweat? Only when I'm indoor in the house. So that's why me in the winter, I never feel cold. Temperature is inside the body is always around 38 degree 0.5. Outside is cold. Inside is always the same. My temperature in Malaysia is the same temperature as when I'm in Canada at minus 30. So where's the concept of it's I'm cold, I'm hot? It's it's based on the skin. So it's the skin perception that gives the idea of people I'm cold or I'm hot. Which in fact, the body is always at the same temperature. Temperature of Malaysian is the same temperature as Canadian or, uh, or about closely the same. So body temperature is an internal thing, not an external. But we have learned we've been conditioned by the skin. What is, I know in Malaysia, as soon as you drop the temperature below 26 degrees, they say chilly, cold. But it's not cold, 26 degrees. Come on, give me a break. It's winter, I keep my house at 24 degrees. Other than that, it's too hot, 28 degrees. My God, I'm sweating like crazy. Malaysia, 28 all the time everywhere. So that's why me, when I'm in Malaysia, I put the air con all the time because it's too hot and humid in Malaysia. But bring a Malaysian in Canada, they say so cold, so cold, so cold. Us, we like temperature in the summer around 16, 20 degrees. This is very good summer, not too hot, not too cold. And of course, it's all about Theta mind programming. So most of the mental training I do is always inducing the theta mind brain frequency because that's the brain that was active when we were children. And when we are children, we, we reject nothing. We, we accept everything. We don't have preconceived things. We don't have values and belief that limit us. Children are not limited. You can tell a child you're a champion. They will believe it. And I like working with children when they are six, seven, eight years old because they're dreamers. And let's continue dreaming. And I remember one of the Malaysian top athletes, not this Alia Young, in, in a water ski. She started using my mental training program at the age of eight years old. She became the youngest gold medalist at the sea game in Jakarta. And of course, what happened when we are young? Well, we watch our parents and we learn from our parents. So if your parents are high achiever, you have a chance to become a high achiever. If your parents are loser, you have a chance to become a loser. If you're a parent or cheater, you have a good chance to be cheating. So we watch our parents and we copycat our parents. You watch your sibling. So if you're born in a one child family is different than being born in a 17 children family. My father was born in a 17 children family. My mother was born in a 15 children family. So, of course, you learn from your sibling. You watch them. 
and of course you follow like or hate your sibling you watch your relative and your community and we learn a lot from relative and community so if you are in a wealthy community you don't have the same value as poor people community because you have to learn thousands of rules all your life so depending where you live the rules change me i've been raised in a farm for nine years so what did i learn the law of nature so i have an habit i sleep four hours a day and i always wake up around three four five in the morning why my job as a kid on the farm was to collect the egg that the, the eggs that were just hatched by the chicken and of course my my uncle and parents they were going to the to the barn to milk the cow so i've learned the rule of the farm it's nature that called the life on the farm nothing it's not the clock there is no time to lunch time to go there is nature called when it is spring what do you do in spring you do what need to be done in spring when it's summer what do you do in summer you know what need to be done in summer what do you do in the fall season you do what need to be done in the fall season what do you do in winter well you do what you do the rules change but people in the city are completely different urban environment is totally different so to be a member of our family and community the first years are just made on observing the rules and to integrate to condition ourselves to adapt to the rule of the family and the community this include religious this include language this include all kind of behavior that are accepted in our community so that's how we become conditioned like right now we just observed that what happened here in canada with the pandemic well we noticed canada you know jabbing 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 injection injection 90 percent of the people went for injection well there is still people in africa two percent of the population got injection because they have learned to live with disease and to learn about nature that fighting disease is a natural immune system but we live in a very highly educated country very highly postgraduate country people are knowledgeable but people are also very obedient to the law people don't break the law here people follow the law and people have been told careful the police and that's why now we have emergency measure to scare people again so don't break the rule very important but some culture they learn one thing you want to succeed you have to bind the rule to achieve if you follow the rule you will never make it that's good to know but, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh that's good to know so who does whoever want to continue with this conversation make sure you check my youtube channel and also my podcast this conversation will also be in my podcast as well and dr getney he is going to present at the next uh, discussion where he's going to show his presentation slides and talk more detail about the olympic games versus uh summer games as well as the differences the strengths and the athletes so stay tuned and thanks for tuning in and make sure you check the description below on how to contact Dr. Gatney. Cheers yep. for now. Take care. Bye. Very good. Have a good day.